Records, 1942. When Henry told Kiko about his wild ride down South King the night before, she burst out laughing. She searched the lunch line and giggled almost as hard when she saw Denny Brown appear. He wore a defeated scowl like an angry whipped mutt. His cheeks and nose were scabbed over from where his face had skidded along the pavement after his fall. Denny disappeared into the herd of hungry kids. They stampeded by, making their normal abnormal faces as Henry and Kiko dished up a gray mess that Mrs. Beatty soberly called Spam a la King. The bubbling sauce had a subtle green tint to it, almost metallic in its sheen, glossy like a fish's eyeball. All week long, they scraped out the empty steamer trays and dumped the leftovers in the garbage. Mrs. Beatty didn't believe in saving leftovers. Ordinarily, she had Henry and K Kiko place the food scraps in separate buckets to be retrieved by local pig farmers, who used the dregs as slop each night. This time, though, the leftovers went in the regular garbage cans. Even pigs have standards. By Monday, lunch was back to the same routine. In the storage room, Henry and Kiko sat on a pair of upturned milk crates, splitting a can of peaches and talking about what had happened at the Black Elks Club the night that Kiko's English teachers had been arrested and how the curfews were affecting everyone. The papers didn't say much. What they did say about the arrest got lost in the big headline of the week, that General MacArthur had miraculously escaped the Philippines, proclaiming, I came out of Baton and I shall return. Buried beneath the news was a small column about the arrest of suspected enemy agents. Maybe that was what Henry's father had been talking about. The conflict that had seemed so far away suddenly felt closer than ever, especially with bullies like Chaz, Carl Parks, and Denny Brown still out there waging war on the playground. Even though no one ever wanted to be the Japs or the Jerrys, they usually made some little kid play the enemy, hounding him mercilessly. If they ever got tired of it, Henry never saw it. But here in the dusty storage closet, there was shelter and company. Kiko smiled at Henry. I have a surprise for you, she said. He looked at her expectantly, offering the last peach, which she speared with a fork and ate in two big bites. They shared drinks of the sweet, syrupy juice that was left. It's a surprise, but I'm not going to show you until after school. It wasn't his birthday, and Christmas had been months ago. Still, a surprise was a surprise. Is this because I'm storing all your photographs? If so, no need. I'm happy to. Kiko cut him off. No, this is for taking me to the Black Elks Club with you. And almost getting us thrown in jail, Henry muttered sheepishly. He watched her purse her lips and considered that comment, then dismissed his concern, beaming at Henry. It was worth it. Together, they enjoyed a moment of silence that was interrupted by a knock on the half-open door. Scientific proof that some that time sometimes passes all too quickly. Shoe fly, shoe. That was Mrs. Beatty's way of telling them to get a move on. Time to get back to their classes. After lunch, she had usually thundered back into the kitchen, working her teeth with a fresh toothpick, sometimes holding a copy of Life magazine, rolled up like a billy club or a fish bat. She used it to swat flies, which she left laying there, their flattened guts smeared on the metal kitchen counters. Henry held the door for Kiko, who let her hair down and headed back to her classroom. Henry followed. Looking back as Mrs. Beatty settled in with her magazine. It was last week's issue. The cover read, Bathing Suits in Fashion. After school, they pounded erasers, wiped desks, and mopped the bathrooms. Henry kept asking about Kiko's surprise. She coyly deferred. Later, I'll show you on the way home. Instead of walking south toward Nihinmachi, Kiku, Kiku, Kiku led them north to the heart of downtown Seattle. Every time Henry asked where they were going, she just pointed to the massive Rhodes Department store on 2nd Avenue. Henry had been there a few times with his parents, only on those special occasions when they needed something important or something that couldn't be found in Chinatown. Rhodes was a local favorite. Being in the massive six-story building was like taking a life-size stroll through the Sears catalog, but with a certain charm and real-world grandeur, especially with its massive pipe organ, which was played during lunchtime and dinner, special concerts for hungry shoppers, at least it had been until a few months ago when the organ had been dismantled and moved to the new Civic Ice Arena over on Mercer. Henry followed Kiko to the audio section, a corner on the second floor with cabinet radios and phonographs. There was an aisle with long cedar racks of disc records, which to Henry felt lighter and more fragile than Shellac records. Shellac supplies had been limited, apparently, another conscript of the war effort. So vinyl was now being used for the latest hit music like String of Pearls by Glenn Miller and Artie Shaw's Stardust. Henry loved music, but his parents had only an old Vitrola. I doubt it even played any of these newer records, Henry thought. Keiko stopped in front of one of the rows of records. Close your eyes, she said, taking Henry's hand and moving them to his face. Henry looked around first, then complied. He felt a little awkward, but covered his eyes anyway, standing in the middle of the record aisle. 
He heard Keiko shuffling in the racks and couldn't resist peeking through his fingers, watching her from behind for a moment as she flipped through rows of records. He squeezed his eyes shut as she turned them holding something. Open them. Before his eyes was a shiny vinyl record in a white paper sleeve. The simple press label read, Oscar Holden and the Midnight Blue, the alley cat strut. Henry was speechless. His jaw hung open, but no sound came out. Can you believe it? She guessed with pride. This is our song, the one he played for us. Holding it in his hands, he couldn't believe it. He'd never known an actual recording artist, never met one in person. The only famous person he'd ever seen was Leonard Cotesworth, the last man on the Tacoma Narrows Bridge before it bucked and bent and crashed into the water. Cotesworth had been on the newsreels, walking down the middle of the twisting bridge. Henry saw him ride by in the seafair parade and thought he was just an ordinary-looking foal, not a performer like Oscar Holden. Sure, Oscar had been famous on South Jackson, but this was real fame, fame you could buy and hold in your hand. As he tilted the perfect record, he looked at the grooves and tried to hear the music again. The swinging sound of the horn section. Sheldon on saxophone. I can't believe it, Henry spoke in awe. It just came out. I saved up to buy it for you. For us, Henry corrected. Besides, I can't even play it. We don't have a record player. Then come to my house. My parents want to meet you anyway. The thought of her parents wanting to meet him left him feeling flattened, flattered and shocked. Like an amateur fighter being given a shot at a prize fight. Excitement, custom fit with doubt and anxiety. Fear, too. His parents probably would have nothing to do with Keiko. Were her parents that different? What could they possibly think of him? Henry and Keiko took the record to the checkout counter. A middle-aged woman with long blonde hair pulled back under a clerk's hat kept busy counting change at the register, sorting it into a large tray. Keiko reached up and set the record on the counter, then opened a small purse and pulled out $2, the price of a new record. The blonde kept counting. Patiently, Henry and Keiko waited for the clerk to finish counting what was in her till. She made detailed notations of the amounts writing on a sheet of paper. While he and Keiko waited, another woman came up behind them, holding a small wind-up wall clock. Henry watched in confusion as the clerk took the clock over his and Keiko's heads and rang it up. The clerk took the money and handed the change back and the clock in a large green road shopping bag. Is this counter open? Keiko asked. The clerk just looked around for another customer. Excuse me, ma'am, I'd like to buy this record, please. Henry was becoming more annoyed than the clerk looked, her hip cocked, her jaw set. She leaned down and whispered to them, then why don't you go back to your own neighborhood and buy it? Henry had been given dirty looks before, but he'd never experienced something like this. He'd heard about things like this in the South, places like Arkansas or Alabama, but not Seattle, not the Pacific Northwest. The clerk stood there, her fist dug into her hip. We don't serve people like you. Besides, my husband is off fighting. I'll buy it, Henry said, putting his I am Chinese button on the counter next to Kiko's $2. I said, I'll buy it, please. Kiko looked ready to cry or storm out. Her fist rested on the counter, two white knuckle balls of frustration. Henry stared at the clerk, who looked confused, then annoyed. She relented, snatching the $2 and flicking his button to one side. She handed the record to him without a bag or a receipt. Henry insisted on both, afraid she'd yell for store security and report that they'd stolen the record. She scratched a price on a yellow receipt and stamped it paid, shoving it at Henry. He took it, thanking her anyway. He put his button in his pocket along with a slip of paper. Come on, let's go, he said to Kiko. As a long, on the long walk home, Kiko stared blankly ahead. The joy of her surprise had popped like a helium balloon, loud and sharp, leaving nothing to hold but a limp string. Still, Henry held the record and tried his best to calm her down. Thank you, this is a wonderful surprise. This is the best present I've ever been given. I don't feel very giving or grateful, just angry. I was born here. I don't even speak Japanese. Still, all these people everywhere I go, they hate me. Henry found a smile and waved the record in front of her, handing it to her. Seeing it made her forget. Thank you, she said. She looked at the record as they walked. I guess I'm used to teasing at school. After all, my dad says they're just dumb kids that would pick on weak boys and little girls no matter what part of town they're from. That being Japanese or Chinese just makes the heckling that much easier. We're easy targets. But this far from home and a grown-up part of town? You'd think the grown-ups would act different, Henry finished her sentence, knowing from his own experience that sometimes grown-ups could be worse, much worse. And at least we have the record, Henry thought, a reminder of a place where people don't seem to care what you look like, where you were born, or where your family was from. When the music played, it didn't seem to take one lick of difference if your last name was Abernathy or Anjou, Kung or Kubaswasi. After all, they had the music to prove it.